Ladies and gentlemen, we have guests. We have regular attendees. We got all sorts of people here. Uh, I am thrilled to be your host this and every Monday. My name is Eric Hatch. I'm a part of Real Brokerage, and so we host this at Real, but I run a class called CEO Connect. I love speaking to leaders and people who are in uh, positions of influence. Now, leadership doesn't come from t- title, leadership comes from influence. And so whether you have a team or a solopreneur, I think we're all leading different areas of our world. Uh, We have a larger crowd than usual today because uh, we were intentional on making some invites because of the things that are happening in the industry right now. Uh, Lots of changes, lots of energy shifts and anxiety around the new uh, NAR settlement agreement. I want to give you a little of a quick encapsulation, but I want you to know that I have two uh, people here with me that are going to help deliver the message. My first is my brother, Robbie T. Uh, Robbie T. and I have been coaching partners together for uh, about eight years, and we've worked together uh, about 10 and a half uh, in this world. And so uh, us trying to deliver this message comes on the backs of not only us helping to lead uh, one of the highest producing real estate teams in the, in the industry, but also uh, getting the privilege to coach so many of you. And neither of us are experts, but we are really passionate students. And our goal is to try to help you execute on the right strategy session, the right buyer consultation. That's where we're going today. In addition to us, we have Connor Johnson, our right-hand guy uh, who has been trainer to the stars for the last number of years. Connor and I have worked together almost 10 years. Uh, Previously, uh, he was the first uh, showing partner, agent partner that we ever hired, then uh, a great buyer agent, then trained all of our agents, and now is training agents around the country. So the three of us get the privilege of executing these conversations in real time all the time. And I know that uh, some of you are here with real. Some of you are not here with real. There is no sales pitch whatsoever. We're just trying to give value. Okay. Um, I do have an invitation for you at the, uh, I do have an invitation for you at the end of this conversation. And that is an event that we're doing in Fargo that I think you would be silly not to come to. Uh, It is the best event of the year that happens in real estate. And it just happens to happen in our backyard because we can curate a five-star experience uh, on a much easier playing field. Lots of you have been to Fargo before and you're coming again. And we're so excited to host. Also, Mike uh, Novak is pointing out that Connor once tried being an ISA for like a day and a half and it was God awful. So I just want to be clear on that. Okay. Here's the mission. Here's the goal is uh, the industry has been a shaken. It has been in a weird tailspin of sorts. And lots of experts are piping in to give their two cents on what NAR is doing. You won't hear that from us today. Uh, We're not here to proclaim that NAR is a superstar, that NAR is a giant failure. Uh, We're not here to proclaim any of that, but I think there are two changes that everybody needs to know Uh, because, because you're seeing all these summations and I'm trying to boil it down. And I have two simple changes. Uh, The first is that uh, in the MLS, no longer come July, uh, no longer will it be required for a seller to pay a buyer's brokerage. Now, many will, uh, but it's not going to be publicly displayed, meaning uh, the buyer agents and the other realtors aren't going to be able to see it. And it used to be a dollar. It's now zero dollars. So that's the first change. Uh, How we find out about compensation is going to take a direct one-to-one. I'm guessing that there's also going to be uh, websites that are going to try to hack this and yard signs and all the aforementioned. So that is the first piece. The second piece, and this is where we're going with our conversation today, is that buyer's agreements will need to be signed and you will need to have an exclusive right to represent contract with the buyer, just like you have with the seller on a listing agreement. And part of that agreement is a disclosure of compensation, how you get paid. And so many people are fearful that uh, buyers, buyer agents won't get paid. So many people are fearful that they won't be able to get buyers under uh, contract. I honestly don't know how it's going to be measured and monitored. I think that's an interesting sidebar conversation is I'm not sure how that's going to become uh, the thing, but regardless of our opinions of it, these are the changes that are uh, happening right now. And so my goal is over the next hour to give you an exact blueprint of what needs to happen in order for you and your agents to get paid as a buyer's agent every time. I think it is uh, the biggest fear that we have is where am I going to get paid? How am I going to get paid? And so that is the focus. 
Uh, I'll be doing my best to tee up Robbie and Connor, but please uh, keep the conversation flowing in the chat box. Uh, Robbie and Connor, please tend to that as I'm going to get into the, the grind of things. And there is a lot of us to learn. Uh, my buddy, Jeff is a great real estate coach. And I think that this has to be our North star in this. Okay. Regardless of what we say and what we do, if we don't keep the, the, the client first, we are about to fail. And so many realtors have a fear mindset right now. And I'm worried about it. Uh, commission breath smells nasty. Commission breath smells really nasty. So you have to keep that as a North star, but here's what we need to understand. These are, these are basic philosophies of real estate. We have to know the needs, the wants, and the desires of our clients. This has not changed prior to last Friday. And this has not changed after last Friday. This is all still the same. And so with that, we need to understand that buyer representation is an increasing thing from where it was 20 plus years ago. Uh, it used to not be a thing as much, two thirds, and now 88%, literally almost nine out of every 10 has representation on it. But Robbie, I'm going to pitch to you here because I think there's an interesting thing that happens in our industry right now. Uh, and that is the Zillow effect, the Zillow yeah. effect of all these ghost shows uh, yeah. and, and the way in which people operate has changed much of how we actually represent people. So uh, speak to that for a moment, if you would. Yeah, so it, it's really interesting. What, what you're referring to is the fact that Zillow was really pushing towards don't talk about anything. If you guys have heard Zillow talk, they, they have this saying, this acronym called ALM, Appointment Listing Motivation, which is basically just go open the door for us is what Zillow has been pushing. And as Eric kind of alluded to earlier, that, that will just simply not be allowed. And we have no idea how they're going to police it and that sort of thing. But what I, I think it really comes down to is, I think, irregardless, I think the big point I want to make right here is, irregardless of whether we can go show a home without a buyer broker or not, if you don't do a buyer consultation before showing homes, I think you're you're trying to play catch up. And here's what I mean is, if you really want to protect your commission going forward, setting up and partaking in a strategy session every single time is going to be your simplest way to protect your commission. And it's going counterintuitive to so much of what's been pushed the last, really since 2020 with Zillow and, and not just Zillow, other, other people as well. Uh, it needs to be noted that most agents, and, and you maybe aren't like most agents. However, most agents are not used to getting an exclusive right to represent contract prior to showing. It's one of the reasons why buyers have been so increasingly frustrated over the last number of years. It's one of the reasons why we saw some buyers write 10, 20, 30, 40 offers without getting something accepted was because uh -huh. they didn't have a great strategy session. So this not only is advantageous for us getting paid, which of course matters. That's the, the dog whistle that we use to get many of you here in the room today, but even more so it's advantageous that we serve our clients better. And a strategy session is one of the ways in which we do so. So I'm going to go quick. Uh, I will make this slideshow available to you afterwards. I will uh, have a recording for you. And we have this even broken down into a PDF for you also. So you can copy it, print it, and use it for you and your agents. We have three jobs. Don't overcomplicate this, everybody. Three jobs. This is not hard. It's just going to take precision and accuracy. And most of us are struggling on this. So with all, of the, and with all this being said, you are in an opportunity time here with it being the end of March and these changes don't come, come to full fruition until July. And that is to start role-playing this. If this isn't a part of your regular practice, I think that you are missing out. Connor, uh, how would you best recommend that people role-play uh, these strategy sessions? Because you've walked people through this time and time again. Did I lose Connor? He was here. Well, now this is silly. Okay, we'll go back to him, everybody. When Connor comes back, please meet him with a bunch of shame. Okay, first thing we have to do, do not call it a consultation. Do not. Do not call it a consultation. I think so many people use that word consultation, but do you know what I have a consultation for? Is the wart on my butt. Like that's what people have consultations for, are things that are like medical procedures. People have, I shouldn't have said wart on my butt, but I'm just making sure people are paying attention. Consultations 
feel uncomfortable for the person on the other side of it. Instead, a strategy session puts the onus of focus on the buyer. When we can pivot and shift and put that onus of focus on the buyer, we make them the star of the show. In a presentation or consultation, you, the realtor, are the star. And I want to be really clear with you. You are not the star. You are not. You are the supporting actor lifting up and highlighting the buyer. This is all about them. This is not all about you. Uh, I want to give you an example, okay? First of all, take a look here. Look at that gorgeous hair. Look at what we're, what we're working with now, but look at that gorgeous hair. This is 2010. Uh, I was first a solo agent in the industry, and then I made my way to uh, being a buyer agent on a team for about 18 months before I then went full-time into real estate as a solo agent that started a team, and now I'm a coach. Let's just soak in the fax number here on this card. Also, I just need to know, there's not even a zip code associated with it, uh, or an area code, excuse me. It's just, uh, just the fax number. Hit me up, okay? So all that to be said, here's what happened. I had just attended family reunion for Keller Williams. And I saw Ben Kinney give a listing presentation. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing is pure gold. It was like 35 slides. And I had just purchased an iPad too. So, you know, my flex was, my flex game was strong. Right. And I was, I was living my best life. And my admin Kim uh, referred me to uh, an agent, uh, or excuse me, referred me to a seller. And I went to that seller's house. And I did what everybody does. I walk around the seller following uh, him around the place. And then we sat down at the table and I went to my listing presentation that I had stolen from Ben Kinney. And I put it on the table. And for 35 slides, I highlighted and pointed out all the reasons why I'm great as a realtor. Here's my stats. Here's my, here's my flex. Here's everything that I know. This is all the reasons why I'm great. And I made myself the star of the show. When I finished, I'm like, all right, dude, you're ready to sign. And he's like, uh, uh, like, I just want to think about a couple of things. I get back to you. I'm like, cool, no problem. And I walked out like that cock of the walk thinking that I was just on top of the game on top of the world because I had served this guy so inherently well. I get back to the office and Kim, my admin is welled up with tears and red in the face. I'm like, Kim, what's wrong? She's like, what did, what did you do at that listing appointment? I'm like, I freaking crushed it. What do you mean? That's what I did. I crushed it. She's like, he absolutely hated you. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you didn't ask him a single question about him. You made nothing about him as the star. And so because of all of this, I made myself the star. I talked about me. I didn't talk about him. It was one of the biggest mistakes I had made. And I learned so long ago how important it is in these strategy sessions to not try to be the star, but instead to try to shine the light on the other person. Uh, Robbie, if you would, uh, Connor's having some audio issues. Uh, I want you to go back uh, for a moment and talk about the importance of role play and why that will be so advantageous for people to do here as we continue on. Yeah, I think uh, my favorite quote that Eric's ever said about role play was if you're not role playing with each other, you're practicing on your, your clients. And I think far too many of us, that's what we do is we go carve our teeth on our leads, on our friends and on our family instead of with other good professionals that are maybe in this room or, or on your team. Um, I, I think though that not all role play is created equal to, to hit on this point, meaning that if you're just role playing the same thing over and over again, and you're not creating variance to it, and you're not increasing the difficulty, it's frankly pointless to be doing. It, it's not going to do any good. I would set up, if I were in you guys' shoes, I would set up role play like this. Uh, yeah, Alan Iverson, most expensive training ever. That's a real, I'm stealing that. There you go, AI. Um, I would set up role play like this. I think if you want really good role play, there needs to be three roles being played in every single role play. Number one is somebody playing the role of the agent or the ISA, the lead converter, I guess you could say. So if you're an agent practicing doing a strategy session, there's one person doing that. The second role that someone needs to play, of course, is the role of the client or potential clients or lead. So you have the converter and you have the opportunity now. But I think a really important role is the, the role of a third party observer. This is literally someone who's not in the role play at all, who's literally just watching. And their whole job is to give feedback to the other two individuals. Um, also, 
the one big thing that uh, um, we have used uh, that in our team, and there's some others here that have as well, is we have a role play game that we created to literally create different scenarios. Because I'm a, a DC, meaning if I role play with Eric and I just have to play the role of a DC all the time, I don't get any better. I have to learn to mirror and match and role play. So the whole point of the game is to give myself and others different roles. So there can be thousands upon thousands of scenarios instead of just practicing the same thing over and over again. Um, but there you go, Hatch. That's my thoughts on role play. Awesome. Robbie, do me a favor, put a link to our role play game. We're not trying to sell stuff here, but it's, it's certainly valuable to people. So we'll put a link if that's of interest to you, go ahead and grab that. Um, Put in the chat box, everybody, if you would, how often uh, a week do you or your team role play? Zero to seven. Uh, zero means zero days a week. Uh, seven means seven days a week. Curious. Uh, man, we have an opportunity here if y'all are at uh, zero, one, two, three, or four. Uh, I see some people at five. Pretty awesome. Three days. Really great. I will tell you, if you're at zero, don't go to five. Go to one or two. Uh -huh. Yeah. Don't, don't jump from, I've never worked out in my life to I'm uh, now running a marathon every day. Like, like don't jump to that, move the needle one yeah. little bit. And we're going to give you stuff that you can practice with here. So uh, in this season, especially of uncertainty, it's going to be super important that we get very practiced in this. Okay. With that being said, uh, the first thing that we have to do when we meet with a buyer is, we, and that's the situation that we're in the role play piece that we're at. The thing that we're focusing on here is what happens when you are face to face with that buyer. Sometimes this happens on the phone. I always recommend that this strategy session happen in person. It doesn't need to happen in your office, but if you can, that's a great advantage. It can happen at a coffee shop. It can happen at the first showing that you're meeting them. If you, if you have a 9 a.m. showing with them, ask that 8.30 you meet with them so that you can strategize in the car or you can strategize before you go into the house and work on all these things. And so the very first thing I recommend people doing is to frame the situation. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm, I need to take this on and I'm going to go back to this screen in just a moment. In the words of Captain Phillips, I'm the captain now, okay? Uh, the Tom Hanks movie where like the, the pirates take him over and the guy steps on is like, I'm the captain now. Like that's the mindset that your buyer agents and you representing buyers has to have is like, I'm in the driver's seat. Our industry has given us the different mindset. And that is the buyer tells me the house they want to see and when they want to see it. And so I just need to be responsive to them. And if they want to ride on it, great. But they have access to 95% of the stuff that we have access to. And we've literally lost much of our power. This is not a control for power. This is not a move for power. This is a move to help them get the house they want at the price they want on the terms that they want. That's what this is. The purpose of a strategy session is to get them the house they want at the price they want and the terms that they want. That's it. And so the strategy session is important. And I'm going to, in that strategy session, sit with or stand with a buyer. And I want to say, listen, there's four things that are going to happen. As we talk, number one, I need to learn everything I can about you. Everything, everything. I need to know uh, what makes you uh, wake up at night uh, because you're anxious and what make, makes you fire out of bed in the morning because you're so excited. Uh, I need to know what you know about the market. Here's what so many of us do on the market. Robbie, speak to this. But I think that most of us try to mansplain to our clients what's happening in the market instead of actually asking great questions and helping them to self-discover. Why is mansplaining so dangerous in this situation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you walk through that one, but I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't know what you're referring to. Well, uh, shame on you, Robbie, get in my head, first of all. Uh, second of all, here, here's what happens. No, the, when irony, you... the irony of mansplaining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you tell, you sell. There it is. When you tell somebody, here's what happens in the market, you are, you are disarming them the ability to self-discover. Also, insecurity flexes, okay? 
insecurity flexes because if you're nervous about how the buyer is going to react, you're going to tell them everything that they need to know. So if I were to meet with Joe Schwartzbauer and I would say this, I'd be like, okay, Joe, well, like right now the market's really busy. And so interest rates are pretty high right now. And because interest rates are pretty high, you'd think that there's uh, less demand, but there's actually still a lot of demand. And so house prices have gone up quite a bit lately. And so we're expecting to see multiple offers the first time a house hits. And then uh, by the way, we're also now dealing with all these new NAR rules, but don't worry. Like I'm still going to get paid by the other side, but if I don't get paid by the other side, then I'm going to get paid by you. So like Joe, everything's going to be good. <sighs> Eric, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can I just say like what goes through my head in that situation the entire time you'd be saying something like that is this guy doesn't know me. Why listen to a word he's even telling me? Like that app is so platinum to the point of like learning who they are is like foundational before you start to coach them. Yeah. Yeah. Like that popped into my head subconsciously as you mocked in that. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So with, within this, uh, it's so important. It's so important that we understand what they know. We don't tell them what we know that chance will come, but we understand what they know. Okay. Number three, this word is so important as a customized game plan. When somebody hears the word customized, I think it triggers. It's this like subtle little nuance piece of if I, if I do a one size fits all kind of thing, I go back to the eighties. Uh, I'm a child of the eighties and my sister uh, wore these things called multiples from Benetton. Does anybody remember the multiples? They were these like big Courtney's given a Courtney and I grew up in the same city. She uh, she's about my sister's age and, and multiples were like these one size fits all uh, neon green and yellow and purple colored things that were just boxy and horrible. There's a difference between something that's one size fits all and something that's customized. Okay. When something is customized, it's designed specifically for that person. How do we demonstrate value is when we can customize a plan. The internet can't customize that for somebody. You understand? Like the, the fear that we have is that AI and the internet is going to take things over and blah, 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 blah. Like, we're operating afraid. If we can show up with customization and if we can show up with an emotional connection with people, nothing's going to replace that. Nothing at all. And finally, number four, this is so important, is that we can't prevent pain, yet we're going to minimize the headaches. I used to work at a Mexican restaurant in college and I would go every time to a table. And as I would greet them, I would uh, lower their expectations. And what I would do is I would say, listen, I just got triple sat or the kitchen's backed up, or we had somebody call in sick, whatever it may be. So my goal is to give you great service. But if I'm forgetting something like throw a chip, raise a hand, I'm not going to be offended at all. And immediately they went from like being anxious and frustrated because I didn't get there right away. So now I've explained the situation and I've lowered their expectations. And when you can lower somebody's expectations, letting them know, hey, this isn't going to be perfect. There's going to be a lot of headaches and bumps along the way, but my job is to try to minimize the bumps. My job is to create a smooth ride. When you do that, you're immediately creating an ally with them instead of an enemy. So in these strategy sessions, as you're displaying the value that you're bringing, it's so important that you don't act like you're going to make everything smooth. You're just going to minimize the bumps. So in these strategy sessions, uh, it is equal parts heart and head, okay? Uh, most of the time when you give a presentation, it's all head. You're talking logic. But buying a home is emotional, isn't it? Robbie, you live in the world of coaching people on connecting with emotions. Help us to understand and exacerbate this point for just a moment. And I don't want to have to mansplain this one to you. <laughs> Um, so I think I think a couple things. You, you're about to see that the the first major portion, really the first half of your strategy session, needs to be all about exploring somebody's needs, wants, and desires. And as we dive into it, I think it really comes down to what Maya Angelou said. You guys ever heard the Maya Angelou quote? I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And if we've ever been involved in a really great sales process, the beginning of that sales process that went really well was never you walking into a room and somebody talking about how great they are, or frankly, telling you a strategy right away. 
I think the fundamental flaw that we all make is we all make assumptions. Can we all agree upon that? Raise your hand if that's the biggest flaw I think all salespeople make when we walk into a room is I think I know what Rod wants, what Joe wants, what Sam wants. And I think what, what we're really going to get at here is if you really want to be great in this game moving forward, you can have the best you can have the best consultations in the world. You can have the best frameworks, best everything. You can have the best PowerPoint, the best presentation like Eric talked to uh, talked about from Ben Kenny, but none of that stuff matters if the person isn't feeling heard. And it's actually, there's some psychology behind this. Um, let's just name a fact, y'all. Human beings are afraid of salespeople. People are afraid of salespeople. When you walk into a car dealership, right, for the first time, you could have 1 million percent intent to buying the white car on the lot. But when that salesperson walks up to you, what's the very first thing that we do? We literally get triggered and become afraid. And it's normal. Like we need to recognize, and I, I like to pick on people in real estate sales because for about a year and a half, fear in sales disappeared. Basically between June, well, 2020 through 2022, fear of salespeople disappeared. It was this fake world that we lived in because money said, go spend money, go do crazy stuff with it. But we're back to a world where people are really afraid. And actually, frankly, they usually are always afraid. And here's what happens. I want everybody to write this down real quick. This is what's so key about this whole process is when people are afraid, they resort to fight, flight, or freeze. You see this in, in psychology, in, in, in everything, fight, you push back and fight back, flight, you literally run away or freeze, you just become frozen. And this is what people do when you start selling too quickly. They hang up the phone, they fight back and debate you, or they just freeze if you're in the Midwest. <laughs> the point behind this, y'all, is everything we're referring to here is we're trying to help regulate people. My favorite example of this is if you ever had a kid melt down in the middle of Target. You can't talk about here's the here's the lesson that needs to be learned when the kid's dysregulated, right? It doesn't work. It goes in one ear and actually they either fight, flight, or freeze, right? They fight back harder, they run away harder, or they just freeze. It's what, what the human brain does. Rather, what we need to recognize is by having a really great conversation with humans about their needs, wants, and desires, what happens is people feel safe. And everything we're about to dive into is instead of saying, hey, sell, push, tell them the strategy, push it all. It's we got to make people feel safe. That's where we start. Rock solid, Robbie. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, and so I'm glad I didn't have to mansplain that one. <laughs> All right, gang, uh, we're going to get after, we have four main sections that are imperative for you to understand. Okay. These four main sections look like this section. Number one, this is all a part of the strategy session, four main sections after you frame it. First thing you do before you get into a section is you frame it and you tell them where we're going. Now, section one is all about them. Literally eight, like set a timer as you practice, you'll be blown away at how important this is. Uh, most people will talk for like three minutes and be like, I think, I think that was 15. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, do not just stick at the surface. This is going deeper. Um, and by the way, one of the most valuable things you or your agents can and should do with every single client is to literally take notes, a diligent amount of notes, carry that notebook with you and write down everything your client says. You want to make one that quick person thing on that. important, write it down. Yeah. One quick note of that hatch is people should not take notes. I wouldn't even say on an iPad. Don't do it on your phone. It has to be handwritten. Mm -hmm. There is so much science that shows that if there's technology in somebody's hands, people naturally close off. So you yeah, got to think, they think you're texting. They think you're uh, correct. Yeah. Even if you're not, even if your body, even if you say it, science has shown, studies have shown that people think that you're not paying attention. That's just how humans work. And let's be real. All it takes is one notification and your rabbit trailing down Instagram. So handwrite your notes, y'all. Yep. hundred percent. It is, it is uh, so important. 
Uh, also to be genuinely curious means you don't stick at the surface level. I'm giving you the questions to ask, gang. By the way, when we're done with this, we'll email out a PDF with all these questions, but these are the must ask questions. You can add to it as well, uh, but I'd, I'd ask these questions every single time whenever you're in a strategy session with somebody. There's more you can add to this. I'm not going to belabor this screen for too much, but use this moment to take a screenshot. No, I'll send out this slide deck to you afterwards. Also, we're going to give you every last bit of this uh, because we just want to equip this industry with more tools than what they have right now. Uh, Robbie or Connor, anything to add to this uh, list of questions? Connor, you got any? I know your audio is being weird. Okay. I, Ro I, I think for... For any one of these, if it hasn't been said before, I'm muting you, Connor. Uh, yeah. You were cutting in and out there. So uh, type it in the chat box if you would. Robbie, would you for a quick uh, second uh, explain what a tell me more question is? Yeah, I, I'm actually going to I'm going to spend a little time on this. So I, I would say everybody should write down these key things. Um, first off, in this phase, for me, I'm going through the who the what, when, where, why, how. I'd write down who, what, when, where, why, how. For me, the question I'm asking is who's all impacted by this move? I think it's one of the best questions that you can be asking. Who's all impacted by this move? This is how you get people to bring up their kids or spouses, their parents are maybe helping pay for the down payment, their sister who's heartbroken that they're moving out of town. Who's all impacted by this move? What, what does somebody want? That's pretty self-explanatory. We'll dive into that a little bit later. You all are probably really good at that one. But what I've noticed is not, we don't do the flip side of it, which is, Eric, what are some things you really want to avoid? What are your deal breakers in the house? What are the things that you hate or you don't want? My favorite up here in the North was some people hated wood-burning fireplaces. They'd be like, nope, no chance. My house is going to burn down. I'm like, you just don't have to put wood in there and it doesn't start on fire. But I digress. So what do people want and what do they want to avoid? So we got who, what, when. When ideally do you want to be all moved into your next home? During this process, we need to be clarifying the heck out of this because a lot of people say, well, I want to move in June. And when they say June, sometimes they mean start the process in June. So we need to be clarifying. Does that mean you want to be done in June? Because we know as people that play this game all the time that you need to be starting now to be done in June, right? Most people don't. Who, what, when, where? What's your ideal location? By the way, here's my favorite thing about asking about location. It's a, it's a chess type question. Here's what I mean by this is when I ask about where do you want your next home to be, almost always they're going to give you a specific neighborhood. And when they give you a specific neighborhood, I'm going to ask, well, why is that neighborhood important to you? What do you like about it? And almost always, they're going to say one of probably three things. I'd write this down quick. One, it's close to work. Wow, now they've brought up work. We can dive into work. Number two is family, kids. Number three is recreation lifestyle. What I love asking about location is that almost always is like a game of chess where we're asked the question, it's important to know they want to be in South Fargo or wherever, but more importantly, it opens up the pathway to get them talking about themselves, work, family, friends, recreation. Who, what, when, where, why? This is the biggest thing. This is the biggest one. What is the biggest thing that people are running towards or running away from? What is the gain that somebody is trying to pursue or the pain that they're running from. Very frankly, if you don't figure this out, you know nothing at all. And then how? Very last one, how? How is, have they had a conversation with the lender yet? Are they pre-approved? All these types of things. Those are some of the things that I would be hitting on Hatch. And yeah. then three, three more things quick that I'd write down. These are the three scripts that I think are fundamental to digging deeper. Number one is tell me more. Tell me more is not a script. It's not even just a question. It's a mindset that when Eric says he wants a bigger home, I'm not going to say how many bedrooms and say, well, tell me more about that hatch. Expand upon that for me. Could you clarify that for me? What do you mean by that? And here's why this is key, friends. I, I just got done reading a book probably about four months ago. 
um, that was all about listening. It was the most fascinating, boring book on the face of the earth. Okay. It was called How to Listen If You're Interested. But it talked about how human beings, there, there's a disconnect between how quickly we think and how quickly we can speak. If you're not paying attention, wake up. This is the thing you need to hear today. We think at about a thousand words per minute. That's how our brains think. Even right now, you're thinking about a thousand words per minute. But we can only communicate at about the quickest 250 words per minute. Friends, what does that mean? It means when I ask Eric a question, he's only able to articulate 20%, 25% of what he's thinking. By the way, there's two types of thinkers, people that think in terms of words, right? We have an internal dialogue going on. Sounds crazy, I know. And then there's people that think in terms of pictures. And I always ask people, which one are you? The point behind this, if you think in terms of pictures, you think of a lot more than a thousand words per minute. But the point is, is that when we ask people questions, there literally is a gap between what they say and what they were thinking. Tell me more is brilliant because it's giving somebody permission to bring up the information that they maybe forgot to say or they couldn't say. That's it. It's really, that's the only reason it's so brilliant. Second big script I'd write down is what else? Write down that term, what else? Meaning when Eric gets done telling me all about what he wants in his kitchen, I'm gonna say, Eric, what else is really important to you in your next home? It's the same concept. It's giving people permission to bring up the things that may be thought of because human beings can only run with one thing and talk about one thing. What this is doing is it's bringing all the information that's going on in Eric's head and it's bringing it to the forefront in the conversation to avoid that big sin I brought up earlier, which is we all accidentally make so many assumptions. Third and final script that I would give you all and then I'll shut up is something I call the challenge. I think this is one of the best things that you can be doing in your conversations. A challenge is, Eric, I know that you said you want to do it. You want to make a move in June. You don't want to start the, or you, you want to start the process in June. But let's say the perfect place got listed today. Is that something you'd want to go and view? What this does is it expands upon their, their thoughts. It either breaks their process, meaning they're like, oh no, I do now. Or they'll double down and say, I absolutely uh, would wait till June. There you go, Hatch. Those are my thoughts. Whew. Brother's uh, brother smart and pretty. Man, double threat. He's like the Justin Timberlake of real estate, let's be honest. What a guy. Uh, yeah, really solid stuff, man. Um, so who, what, where, when, why, how, all expansions of this uh, as we go. We're on section two. Remember, I said there's four sections in the strategy session. Uh, first, we frame it. Section number one is all about them. Section number two is about their dreams, everything that they want. Uh, here's the imperative note is this is not a chance for you to start coaching. If you saw in the chat box, Janet said, what happens when somebody uh, has bigger wants and desires than what their budget has? And let me first say this. They all seem to have bigger budgets. <laughs> they all are a bit bigger wants and desires than what their budget is. Instead of mansplaining to them, I'd simply give them a chance to self-discover. That's why our, our need here is if you connect with their heart, you are much more able to realign instead of just speaking to the logic of things. See, Janet, when you speak to just the logic of things of number of bedrooms, number of things and whatever, some realtor is going to give them the answer that they want, even though it's not the answer. Our job is not to give them the answer they want. Our job is to be uh, an honest strategy partner with them. And so we have to earn that right first. And the only way we can earn that right to speak truth to them and to help them to self-discover is if we first understand at the core of how they're made. So we're still building a gathering. Take a look here. These are much more detailed questions. But this is about how you lose and how you win. Literally, if I were to ask Sam, okay, Sam, what does great service look like for you? I'm immediately giving her the assumption that we're working together in a committed relationship. I'm not just going off of like, hey, Sam, what house do you want to see? Instead, Sam, how do I communicate really well with you? See, we're getting more specific now. These are about their dreams and their wants. This is about their experience. And so the last question there in bolded 
is this, and th this is where we now can take Janet's question of like, they, they have uh, champagne wishes and caviar dreams, but they have a, a, a twin home budget, right? Mm -hmm. If that's the case, you need to ask them about what they know about the market. And this is like a cornerstone. This should even be its own section. If I were to redo this right now, or maybe make section three of five about what do they know about the current market? Because I need them to tell me what they know. If I say it to them, they no longer have control and they want control. They deserve control. I work for them. So these questions should be verbatim what you ask. Add to it, but do not take away from it. Have it printed out. Well, again, I'll, I'll give you all a PDF that you can just rip off and duplicate for this. So we set you up for this strategy session. But the carrot that we used here, the way that we got you all into this room is to say, hey, this is about how you make money. This is how you get paid as a buyer agent every time. And I want you to see that the last 43 minutes have crescendoed to this point that we have built value and connection, that we have made this as a chance for you to demonstrate that you are of worth. You haven't even shown market expertise yet. You've just shown interest in them. Some people will tell you to go fast and go past this because they just want the house that they want and the time frame that they want and the, the, the dollars that they want. And I get that. But in my experience, you have to combine head and heart together. So now we move to the customized game plan. This is where I'm going to say, in my experience, what my team has done before, what my broker, if you've never sold a house before, it doesn't mean you don't have an expert hat on. You can say that my team's experience, if you have a team, you can say my brokerage's experience. You can say that the market's currently demanding. Like you can, you can give value to those things. These are little tie down pieces that you can do. But the script is simple. Based on blank, I recommend blank. So we're going to make sure that we have this customized game plan. Before I move forward, we need to know their pre-approval plan. We need to know their speed plan. You want to win with somebody, match their speed match their communication style. You need to talk about what happens when they get punched because they're going to get punched. Most of the time, a buyer shows up and they think they see the house, they write the offer, they win the deal. I, in fact, saw a TikTok talk about the problem was if somebody goes directly to, uh, let's say they go to uh, a lawyer and they're going to pay $1,000 for the lawyer to write up their contract. And as they pay the $1,000 to the lawyer to write up their contract, they're not actually getting sage advice. And you see, if you've asked them about the market, you can now use examples of how you've helped people to win. Your examples are the greatest gift that you have. If I say to somebody, listen, I worked with my client, Ed, a few weeks ago. Uh, Ed came in and he had uh 20% down and he was, uh, he was pre-approved by this bank. And when he made this offer in this sort of way, he won. Now, do you think that's going to match the speed that you and your spouse are, are, are wanting to do with this? See, when you use your examples, you're able to demonstrate the strategy that they need. And the best strategy is asking them, listen, are you, are you going to be in a situation in which uh, you'll be able to write well over the asking price? And what if there's an appraisal gap? Like you're asking a ton of questions here still, but you're curating the game plan for them. Because if you're working with somebody who is a, a, a veteran or somebody who's FHA or somebody who doesn't have a lot of expendable cash, can they and should they buy a house that's new on the market today? I mean, probably not. They need to go buy day old bread on the shelf. We talked about day old bread last week on CEO connect. If they don't have that kind of flexibility on cash, they're going to have a hard time winning on that brand new listing that, you know, is going to get 15 offers on it. And so this is now you're creating the game plan with them, but you can't and shouldn't mansplain it to them. You need them to come to that conclusion. And then based on your current financial situation and based on the fact that you can put down 5% and based on and based on and based on, in my experience, we're best first shopping at day old bread. Day old bread, I'd categorize as any listing that's been on the market two weeks or longer, right? It's a little bit stale. Nobody said yes to it the first go around. Ash, can I chime in with a few things on this, this phase quick? 
please. So I, I would add a few other core elements to the customized game plan that, that I think are, are really important. Um, and it's actually going to tie together to the question earlier about what do we do when people have the champagne taste and uh, when, they, when they're looking for what I like to call like a unicorn. Um, so I, I would say in this phase, I'm doing probably two other big things. One is I do think this is when you can give your TED Talks and you talk about the strategy. You can talk about the market. You can educate people. Like I, I always say, delay giving your TED Talk until this point. Now you can. Now you can talk about all those things. You can educate about what's happened in, in real estate in Fargo the last 10, 15 years, if that's a part of what you want to educate people on. But this I is think the, the first time there's ever a presentation, right? Correct. Yep. This is where we can now teach essentially, which I think is valuable. Um, and, and everybody should recognize that the longer you wait to do that, the more salience, the more important what you say will come across. But the second big thing that I believe needs to happen here, Hatch, is we have to be truth tellers. Yes. And I've noticed two big things about humans. Number one is there's conflict in their own mind about what they want. Have you guys notice this with every single client? And I always, I always frame it like this. There's three main things we're always talking about with our clients. Price, the home, and location. Those are the three main levers that we can pull on, change, alter. So price, the home itself. So how many Condition, bedrooms? Condition, product, right? Yep. Product, right? Doesn't matter. And then location. So if I see that Eric is wanting a $500,000 home, but he's... Uh, only willing to pay 400,000 for it. I'm going to say, Eric, I got to be a truth teller, man. Let's say, and let's assume Eric, that we've tried the <laughs> self-discovery. Of course. Yeah. The They're first move is always self-discovery, but if they don't discover it, it's, it's time to be a truth teller. It's time to be a truth teller. And there's two ways to be a truth teller. Eric on a scale of one to 10, how honest can I be with you? Or Eric, can I be a truth teller with you? And I'm going to put it like this. And I want everybody to write this down. I don't think we should ever tell somebody what to do. I don't, I think we should always give somebody a choice. So watch this, Eric, I, I know that the, the house you want, you've described to me most of everything I'm seeing, it's gonna cost about $500,000, but you've just, you've told me that you wanna say around 400,000. So I gotta ask, out of these three things, what are you most willing to be open to changing? Are you willing to bring your budget up to $500,000 so you can get everything you want in a house? Are you maybe willing to make some sacrifices on the home itself? give up a bedroom or some square footage so we can get closer to 400,000? Or you may be open to looking to different parts of town where there is more homes in that price point that, you, that you're referring to. What are those three options are you the most open to? Robbie, Robbie, I even do that with uh, with team members is uh, Courtney tells me that she wants to sell 30 homes this year. And I see that she's sold two so far and it's March 25th. <laughs> Yep. And so I'm going to say, Courtney, okay, Courtney, based on how things are going right now, do you wish to change your habits or do you wish to change your goals? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Giving them that choice and that question immediately uh, as a truth, you're, you're delivering truth in a constructive, supportive way, right? hundred percent. And, and what happens here is you're not telling somebody what to do. You're reflecting back a reality. And I just mentioned that Eric, in his own head reality. Most people we know are couples, right? And do couples always agree on what they want? Gosh, no. So we gotta say, hey, Eric, I know this is really important to you and it's kind of conflicting with what Emily wants. Where's the common ground, y'all? Where are we gonna settle here? What makes sense for all of you? <clears throat> and Hatch, I just, I wanna bring this up of, so many people think that the value that we bring is in our presentation, in our expertise in the market. And don't get me wrong, I don't wanna discount that. And if you want to go learn how to sharpen those skills, go listen to Sharon because he's the best in the game at it. But I don't think any of those things matter if you're not getting to fundamental clarity and truth of what the heck does Eric want and how's he going to proceed? By doing these things, I think we fail, we discount, isn't that valuable for somebody? I think, frankly, if you can be a truth teller like we just did to someone like Eric, it is one of the most valuable ways you can be a truth teller and help somebody. So I just wanted to, to hit on that, Hatch, that in this phase, I think you talk strategy, but you should also be a truth teller. By the way, what I'm looking for is not, hey, I'm willing to bring my budget all the way up to 500,000. What we're looking for is a conversation. What's the next step? And we're looking for a little bit of movement on one of the three levers. 
And one last piece hatch is if they just say, nope, I'm going to wait for the right home to come along. My honest opinion is run. Because this person thinks Santa Claus is real. This person thinks the unicorns are real. Stop wasting your time. Next, move on. Yeah. Uh, just uh, touching on this very briefly as we as we remain here in section three on the um, <clears throat> on the strategy sessions. Notice the question here, and you heard Robbie say just a moment ago, is how honest do you want them to be? Like developing a customized game plan of of being a truth teller and getting their permission is so important. <laughs> We're going to run out of time here. So I'm going to speak quicker than I have previously. We're section four here. And this might be the most important section because we never practiced this before. The aforementioned three sections, so imperative to practice. But here we find ourselves needing to sharpen this sword for the first time. And I'm going to give you some very, very key cornerstones that you can use, language that you can practice with and things that you can do. But this is now all about the details, okay? Detail number one. Full transparency with your clients. We need to tell them what happened in the market previous to today and how business is conducting as of July. What I mean by this is it was traditional. It was never mandated, but it was traditional that the buyer's brokerage got paid from the seller. That's what used to happen. Business today is that sometimes the buyer's brokerage will be paid by the seller and other times it will not. We don't need to go into more depth than this. I would even ask them, hey, have you seen the, the, the recent lawsuits that have been happening? And this is why it's been happening is because realtors have been a bad uh, communicator of how they get paid. And we want to improve upon that. Number two, this is quickly for sellers. So here's what's going to happen with sellers is their realtor is going to ask them uh, if they think it's to their advantage to pay a buyer's broker commission. I'm of the belief that in a free market, there's always going to be more demand when there's more eyeballs on the product. And I think that you want those buyer agents on your side. And so uh, I think it's always advantageous for a seller to pay a buyer's brokerage, but there's certainly advantages and disadvantages. And these are the conversations that sellers are having right now with their folks. Speak to what's happening on the sell side. Speak to it. That change is afoot, not just on the buy side, but on the sell side as well. Speak to it. Write it out. Oh my gosh. Again, everything get written down. It's so stinking important. Detail number three. Here's the conversation. Again, this is what had happened now. We don't know what's happening in the future. So before we agree to work together, we need to make sure that we haven't figured out that I need to get paid if I do my job. Is that fair? Is it okay if I, uh, if I get paid in this? Is that offensive to ask? So many of us tiptoe around money. So many of us are afraid to have that money conversation. If you're afraid to have a money conversation, I think you're going to struggle being a realtor in this new phase. I don't think it's offensive to talk about how you get paid. On the listing side, I do it every time. And it's not offensive at all. Some reason, some sort of broken little thing in our head says that we're afraid to talk about getting paid. Hey, when I do my job, and by the way, I only get paid at the closing table. If, if this deal never closes, I don't get paid a dime. But if I get paid, or excuse me, if I do my job, I, I get paid. Is that, is that cool with you that I get paid? Awesome. Okay, great. We're both in agreement. Like, I honestly, I don't think that we have to talk about this that much. I think that 80 or 90% of the time, like somebody's gonna be like, yeah, you should be paid. Okay, awesome. Let's move on. I, I think it's that easy. I think we're just worried about that little 10% or 15%. Let me give you an example is I was always fearful of charging a transaction fee. And I thought no way would anybody ever agree to a transaction fee. Now we deliver uh, a plus service, five-star service across the board. And because we deliver that kind of service, we saw our profit margin go down and down and down. And I'm like, man, we better start charging this transaction fee. I'm like, there's no way a buyer or a seller will agree to pay this transaction fee. And literally, when you're confident in how you present it, because you know you're bringing extra value, more times than not, they're always like, yeah, cool. Makes sense. And it's, it's done right there. But we've just, we've belabored this point in our minds far too long. Uh, Jeff is asking, what's, what's the percentage do we ask for 2% or more? Like that is so market specific, Jeff, 
uh, that I, I'm today not going to go into that. Feel free to DM me offline and I will happily uh, go down that path with you, okay? So that's detail number three. Detail number four is we need to give them options. Hey, there's going to be three ways that we get paid. It's going to be one of three. Uh, I think we may have it offered to us, right? Like that's, that's the standard. We're going to, we're going to get offered by the agent that represents the seller that we're going to get paid. But otherwise we're going to try for closing costs or we can ask uh, the seller to pay that commission or it's going to be cash out of your pocket. So one of these three scenarios will, will play itself out if, the, if I don't get paid by the other side. But my goal is to always get paid by the other side. If you're wondering what to role play, it's this conversation right here, this part. Don't skip over the heart stuff, but this is the stuff that your agents and you will fumble on because you've never had these conversations before. Unless you're in a market like ours where we've always done this. And so this is a really natural thing for us. Most people aren't living in that kind of world. Detail number five, uh, don't sleep on your lender. I'm calling a shot here. I think Fannie and Freddie are going to make some changes. And I think that uh, the percent of closing costs to be paid is going to increase or that can be, that can be covered by the seller. And I, I do think that we're going to see appraisers change some things. I think we're going to see Fannie and Freddie change some things, but you should have a conversation actively with the lender to see what strategies they have on this. This is a really important partnership and detail number six. All right. This is what has to happen is you got to get this signed document. According to the new rules with NAR, you have to get this signed document before you show houses. And so as you're going through, and if you haven't done the strategy session and you're just explaining to somebody what needs to happen, it's right here. Now, actually getting this document signed, I don't mean to minimize it for you. I don't know the stories you've been telling yourself, but actually getting this document signed is way easier than you think. Nine times out of 10, it's way easier than you think. That other one time out of 10, you better practice and role play for. Because uh, I'm already seeing things where uh, buyers are going directly to the seller, thinking that they can just go and represent themselves now. And there's going to be those people that go rogue. I can't fix crazy, y'all. But I do know that in a planned strategy session, when you make that person feel like the star and you've connected with their heart, and you've created a customized game plan, and then you have a lock solid presentation of knowing what's happening in your market. And you can deliver your Ted talk of why working with you is the only choice that they should have. Doing those things are going to about guarantee you that you get paid every time. And if they're not willing to sign that document, you become a professional gambler. We're already professional gamblers as realtors. If you don't have that document signed and that agency agreement locked in, you're hoping that the seller is going to pay you. And if you don't have that signed, you're now going against NAR rules. No bueno. And you put yourself at great risk. You put your client at great risk. Like this is the new norm. And these strategy sessions are so much better than a consultation or a presentation. Uh, I have a few things that I need to drop for you. And then Robbie, I want you to give us some closing thoughts. Okay. Yep. Number one, uh, we put in the chat that we have access to uh, a role-playing game and this role-playing game could be a great tool to unlock some things for you. So we have that coming for you. Uh, number two, if you're watching this live and we have your email, cause you signed up for this, we're going to send you this slide deck that we went through as well as uh, the replay of this. We're going to get that to you. Um, also the PDF of all of the questions that we had, we're going to give to you, uh, just to help you with your strategy session. So you can start practicing right away. Uh, Robbie and I also wrote a book and this book is pretty kick butt. So here's how you get a copy of the book. Okay. Uh, you just follow myself or Robbie on Instagram. Uh, he's at real Robbie T I'm at real Eric hatch. And you just DM me or, or Robbie, the word blueprint. And when you do so, you'll get instructions on how you get a copy of our book for free. You just pay shipping and handling. Uh, next week we have, uh, CEO connect again, we're speaking to leaders and people that are making a difference, uh, specifically team leaders in the real estate field, but folks are from all walks of life are there. If you're not a part of real brokerage, like Robbie and I am, we still want to extend the invitation for you to be here to grow with us. And we just know that eventually they'll be like, Hey, these guys are pretty cool. I like rolling with them. And that's good for Robbie and good for me. Uh, Finally, uh, we have a summit. This is the greatest real estate event and leadership development event that happens in the industry. 
And I'm going to put the link here in the chat as well as it'll be in the email afterwards. But Robbie, give us some final thoughts, if you may. So I, I like to look at history for what parallels are there? What time in history can, can we look to to see what's similar to what we're going through right now? And it, it's different in a lot of ways, but very similar in the sense that um, if you guys remember when listing agents in the height of the crazy COVID market started discounting our Cobra, you guys remember that? When sellers started dropping the Cobra from three to two and a half or three to two, I think that is the biggest parallel about what we're about what we're we're going to go through. And here's why is I saw two primary reactions of agents when that started to happen. I saw some people, I'm just going to pick on Eric. Eric was used to getting paid 3% because that's what his market paid out. And then on the listing that he sold, the co-broke was two and a half. Eric just settled and he said, screw it. I'll take my two and a half and that's good enough. But there was another whole group of people that did what we're talking about today. They sat down, they had the conversations with people. They created value by making somebody feel valuable, reflected back a ton of market knowledge. They had confidence talking about buy representation, how it's actually a good thing, frankly. Buy when, when there's a lack of it, like this whole go show game is stupid. I have no idea why it's been so normal in real estate. And by the way, how dumb is it that on the buyer side of things that crappy agents have been getting paid the same amount as great agents? Bye, Felicia. About damn time. Like, it, like there's so much good to come to this, but I digress. But there was two reactions. There was the Eric's who just laid over and said, I'm done. I'll take my two and a half. And then there was others that, that did what we just walked through. And they had people sign an agency agreement and got their full 3%. And if the seller was only paying two and a half, and they couldn't negotiate it and get that 3%, their buyers paid for it. And very frankly, I think 95% of people were like Eric. I'm very scared for those people because their businesses are about to fundamentally change. Are you going to win every single time? No. But if you're like an Ed Stroud who's going to sit down and do a consultation every single time and go through this and get people to sign an agreement, you have nothing to fear. If anything, somebody asks Eric, what should I get them to sign? What you think you're worth. There's some people that are going to get pay raises from this. That they're, the Cobra, the normal was two. They're going to start saying two and a half is what I'm worth. There's going to be those stories. Market, watch. That's coming. My last and final just language pattern piece before we wrap up is I always say when it comes to a consultate or it comes to a, a buyer broker agreement, I always end with, by the way, Eric, if at any point you're not satisfied with my service, man, you just let me know. We'll throw this thing away. We'll get rid of it. Because the biggest thing that they're going to fear is probably not commission or paying. It's being afraid of being locked in with you. Yes. And you suck. yes. So set that to the side and say, hey, at any point you want out, just let me know. No big deal. And I always put a caveat, like if we're already pending on a home that changes things, we can talk about it later. If you do these things, you do great strategy sessions, you make people feel really important, you have nothing to fear, there's tons of opportunity in front of you, and you're going to get paid your full amount. And frankly, it's the 500,000 million agents who are stuck in their ways of doing old crap, they're in trouble. Just don't be them, please. That's all I got, Hedge. You had such a subtle nuance piece there that, that talked about make yourself uh, available to be fired, but be so valuable that they never will. Right. And I think that that's what we try to do today. And that's, that's such a good out is to always make sure that somebody knows that, Hey, if this isn't going according to plan and they're frustrated with your services prior to going uh, under contract on a home, that they can just tear up that agreement uh, and, and, and you'll go on your merry way. Super important to give them that out. Do me a favor, folks that are still here, uh, put in the chat box your biggest aha a takeaway as people that create content weekly. And we are here every single week. Robbie, when is your class that you do? Uh, Thursday afternoons, I believe it's at 2 p.m. Central. I should know that off the top of my head. Thursday, 2 p.m. I host it with a buddy named Matt, Matt McKenzie. He's one of the best ISAs that have played the game. Such a good dude. Every week we talk about how to have conversations that set appointments, frankly. So uh, come join us Thursday. Love to see you. Uh, so you'll have uh, CEO Connect Mondays at 10 Central Time. Robbie's uh, How to Have Conversations 
Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time, open to everybody. Uh, we want to just keep training this industry. But the more feedback you give us, the more valuable this becomes because we are continuing to put out content uh, multiple times a week between our podcasts, between this, between webinars that we do. Like our job is to fuel you. So hope that's helpful. Uh, please consider coming to the summit in Fargo in June. It is the best leadership and growth event that happens in any industry at any time. Uh, thank you for being here. God bless you. I'm going to capture a little bit of this stuff. And if you have any feedback for us that we haven't yet heard, we are here to listen. Hey, y'all. Much love. Thanks, Robbie. All right, gang. That was awesome, guys. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks, Court. We I did the thing. Watch. What's that? I can't wait to rewatch. <laughs> Wow. I hope I look good in uh, 3D or 4D or whatever it is. <laughs> you always look good, Eric. I mean, uh, let's be clear on that. Yeah, but I'm not, I, I had no blue today and uh, hard to make no. my eyes dance. I noticed. I noticed. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Hey, hey Eric, I, yeah. where can I find your, your courses, your upcoming stuff that's happening? Is it in the Academy or where? Uh, so some of the stuff we do the in the Academy, some of the stuff we do through hatch coaching. So uh, Ruby, put your, uh, put your email in the chat box and I'll make sure you get added to our list. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do, 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 do. Thank okay. you very much. This was awesome. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you got value. Right. Thanks, Aaron. Good to have you. Uh, Melinda, I need your email address. There we got it. Okay, cool. We're going to add you all to it. Thanks, gang.